lecture for this evening, a special welcome to you as well. Just a few wee announcements. We do have a Q&A this evening and there are uh, cards here if you want to fill out a question and just put it in the card. A reminder that this is the, last oppor the only opportunity to ask Dr. Faulkner uh, any questions. So let me just remind you uh, that you can do that. Also, tomorrow evening, uh, everyone is invited to an ice cream social at the field house, uh, and that is after the last session. So if you're going up there anyway to dance or whatnot, then just, uh, and even if you're not, then uh, just a reminder that there's ice cream there as well. Dr. Bailey? Just for conference participants, for that. <laughs> Any other announcements? Well, in a moment, I'm going to pray and sing, but just uh, let me reintroduce uh, Dr. Master to you. He'll be coming up after we sing. Uh, if you're a guest this evening, Dr. Master will be our first speaker. Uh, his PhD is from the University of Aberdeen. He is president of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in South Carolina. He is the associate editor for the Banner of Truth magazine and co-host of the Theology on the Go podcast. He's the author of several books, including Growing in Grace, which has just been released by Banner of Truth and... Uh, are, they are available on the book table uh, as well. So let me encourage you to get that. And he's written some other stuff, and he's a co-editor of some other stuff. <laughs> and, and he's married to Elizabeth, and they're parents uh, of two daughters. So thank you, Dr. Master, for coming to speak to us. Well, let's commit this time to our Lord in prayer, and then we'll sing together. Our Father in heaven, our mighty God, we rejoice this day that you are God alone and there is no other God beside you. You created the seemingly endless universe. You uh, called, you put every star there and called them all by name. And you are a mighty, powerful, omnipotent God. And we rejoice that we are yours, your covenant children, that you love us, that you care for us, that you shower us with blessings, that you gave us the very greatest gift it was possible to give in giving your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross. We rejoice this evening that he has risen and has ascended and is seated at your right hand is in session, ruling all things, and he is coming again for his bride, and we will be with him forever and ever. Thank you for that hope that we have. And now, O oh Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to worship you well, putting away every distraction, that we would meet with you, our God, that we would relish this time together in your word, that we would delight in you. We pray, asking for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, would you stand for Psalm number 103? Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, my soul, my whole heart, ever bless his holy name. 
evening in a number of different passages, and again, with the overarching goal of growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'd like to do first, though, is look to the Lord in prayer and ask for the help of His Spirit. Our Father, we thank You for the many manifold blessings that are ours in Jesus Christ, not least the fellowship we enjoy with each other and the forgiveness of our sins and the revelation that we have in Scripture. We thank you for all of these spiritual blessings. We ask that you would attend to our reading and study of your word this evening with the power of your spirit. We ask that your spirit would work through your word. We know that your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we pray that your word would do its work in our midst, convicting us of sin, training us in righteousness, thoroughly equipping us, for every good work. We pray that in all of this, in our hearing of your word, in our study of your word, in our meditation on your word, you would glorify your son in our midst. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In April 2012, Newsweek magazine had a cover story, and the cover story had this title. It said, Forget the Church, Follow Jesus. It was written by an author by the name of Andrew Sullivan, a journalist whose work has been widely published and is still widely published today. Some very provocative things that he's written over the years, but this one arrested my attention. Forget the Church follow Jesus. And as the article unfolded, the argument that Sullivan made was simply this. He said, we can attend to the things that Jesus taught. We can understand who Jesus is. We can follow after Jesus in some measure uh, because he's worthy of that. Uh, But the only way to really do it well is to completely jettison any commitment to the church. And he went on to delineate the reasons why he thought this was the case, because he said the church was guilty of all kinds of atrocities throughout history, and the church was unreliable, and the church was not always safe, and there were all kinds of scandals in the church. And it was an unfair portrait, but you get the picture. His point was that you can have Jesus, and you can follow Jesus, and he would even say you should follow Jesus, but in the context of leaving the church behind. Now, in contrast to that, of course, we have the testimony of the Scriptures and the testimony of Jesus Christ himself. And I want to turn to one particular testimony that we have in the Scriptures that I think directly undermines everything that Sullivan was arguing for it. So turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now let me describe to you while you're turning there a little bit about the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was a great ancient city. 
fact, it's a city, the ruins of which you can still visit today, and you can see some of the uh, famous buildings of Corinth that are even extant to this, to this day. It was, a, it was a city, though, that was known for its immorality, particularly its sexual immorality. There are different estimates about the number of temples in the city of Corinth, but a kind of middle-of-the-road estimate that historians give is that there were about 26 individual pagan temples throughout the city of Corinth, including one that overlooked the city of Corinth and was known especially for its prolific temple prostitution. So Corinth was infused with all kinds of idolatry. Corinth was infused with all kinds of sexual immorality. In fact, it actually uh, became a sort of byword even in the ancient world. Certain kinds of sexual immorality were, were just known as to Corinthianize uh, because they were so wrapped up in the life of that city. Now, the church of Corinth was founded by the Apostle Paul, but by the time he writes this letter, there had been a number of problems that had emerged in the church at Corinth. So, so the city of Corinth was one thing. It was overrun, really, with paganism. But the church at Corinth had its own series of problems. If you went through the, the book of 1 Corinthians and tried to delineate all the problems, you'd find that virtually every chapter has some major, major challenge. It's a corrective letter. Paul gives all kinds of very direct correction for the Corinthian sin. Let me give you a few examples. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians, Paul describes the church at Corinth, and one of the things he describes about that church is that it was divided. Some were following after one preacher that they'd heard, some were following after another, and they formed these little subgroups, fan clubs for Paul and Apollos and others whom they had heard. And that created division in the church because each of the fan groups thought that they were better than the others, uh, that they really had their corner on the truth in a way that the other groups did not. If that weren't bad enough, if that kind of division within the church weren't bad enough, Paul also says that they had for some time tolerated sexual immorality in their midst that was not even countenanced among the Gentiles. And you remember what the Gentile city was like. Paul says, you've celebrated things that even the Gentiles would consider to be shameful. More than that, there were lawsuits within the church. We don't know the exact nature of these lawsuits. There are a number of theories that the commentators have about why exactly these suits were being filed from one believer to another. But again, a very divisive matter within the context of the church and dishonoring to the Lord, as Paul says. We also know that some within the church, some who are at least professing Christians, were still pulled away to those pagan temples and even to the pagan temple prostitutes. They were misusing Christian liberty. They weren't thinking about the needs of others, the spiritual growth of others. They were simply focused on themselves and their own supposed rights in the gospel. And, and if all that weren't enough, even when it came to the Lord's Supper, even when it came to communion itself, this church had all kinds of misunderstandings and problems to the point where the Apostle Paul says, some of you in the church have actually gotten sick and some of you have even died, and that's the judgment of God on you because of your misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper. If that weren't enough, they also seem to misunderstand the role of men and women within the church and the appropriate responsibilities of each. They misunderstood the nature of spiritual gifts. They didn't clearly understand why the Lord gave certain gifts at certain times and what the purpose of these gifts were. And it was another cause for division. And if all of that weren't enough, they seemed to be tolerating and even toying with a false teaching about the future resurrection of the body. And Paul, in no uncertain terms, tells them that if you let that doctrine go, if you're not 
clear on the future resurrection of the body, which the whole Bible teaches, then it really undermines even your understanding of the resurrection of Christ. So the stakes couldn't have been higher. And yet, with all those problems, and with all that wickedness in the city, I want to read these words to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. You can see it in your own text of Scripture. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Despite all the problems in the church of Corinth, any one of them would make us say that the church was perhaps beyond repair. And yet despite those problems, despite the way in which unbelievers had crept in and false teaching was gaining a foothold, despite all of that. What Paul says is, I, thank, I give thanks to my God always for you. It's a totally different perspective than the one reflected in the Newsweek article. The Newsweek article made a great deal of all the problems within various churches, and I, and I, and I say it, it handled them unfairly, I think, but Paul handles them with a very clear eye, and yet says, I give thanks always when I come to God and think of you. Well, why was that? How could Paul have that kind of perspective, particularly in the context of a church that was in need of correction? And don't misunderstand, Paul doesn't paper over these problems. Paul is very direct in rebuking them, in directing them about what they must do. And yet at the same time, He's thankful for them. How is this even possible? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll suggest one thing from this paragraph, although there are a number of things in this paragraph that Paul highlights. But I'll, I'll, just, I'll just suggest one to you because I think it gets at the heart of the Apostle Paul's thinking on the church. And the one thing I want to point out to you is this, that in every verse in this paragraph, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, in every verse in this paragraph, what Paul highlights about this church is that there were those in the church who made up the church who were in fellowship with Christ. Look at this. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in every way you were enriched in him. Verse 6, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, so that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, when Paul reflected on the church, one of the realities that pervaded his thinking, one of the realities that you can't miss if you're going to read anything that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was this, that the church, the true church, is the body of Christ. It's those who are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, who are united to Christ by faith. In fact, Paul goes on to say this about the church in Corinth in in chapter 13, verse 27, he says it very clearly when he's describing them. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And see, this is why if we're going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the non-negotiables is that we must be in, engaged with the body of Christ which is the church. This fellowship 
with Christ is pervasive, as I said, but we might ask the question at this point, how did Paul gain this understanding of the church? How did he, how did he get there? Why is it that in every letter that you read in the New Testament written by Paul, he will talk about the church as being the body of Christ, in fellowship with Christ, the household of God. Where, where did he get all of that from? And the answer to that question really goes back to Paul's conversion itself. I imagine if we went around the room, each of you who are genuine Christians could say something about the Lord's work in your life, and particularly those first times when you were aware of your own sinfulness and you're, you were aware of Christ's free offer of forgiveness in Him, the promises of Christ, the promises of Christ about heaven and about forgiveness of sins, and, and, and perhaps there, were moment, there was a moment or even moments in your life where those realities became very clear to you. For the Apostle Paul, his conversion was a dramatic one, and it's recorded for us in Acts chapter 9. The interesting thing about Paul's dramatic conversion is that there was one truth about Christ, one truth about the church that was driven home at his conversion. Perhaps you remember what the Lord said to Paul. You remember it was Saul at the time. He was, he was going on his way to persecute Christians in Damascus. He had already done his work of persecuting Christians in Jerusalem. And he was eager to get to a new city to try to break up the church and make people have to leave and go into exile and put them in prison if possible. He was eager to do this. And you remember, he's struck down by a great light, and the Lord Jesus Christ appears to him and says this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And if you think about that for any length of time, you think that one answer that Saul could have given at that time, had he not understood what was being revealed to him, he could have said, well, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting the church. That never even occurred to Saul because he understood, it seems, immediately what it was that Jesus was saying to him. In persecuting them, you are persecuting me. And indeed, that is precisely what the Lord said to him in Acts chapter 9. And so it's no accident that for the Apostle Paul, this notion that the church is the body of Christ pervades everything he does and everything he writes. Because from the moment of his conversion, it was impressed upon him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In persecuting them, you are persecuting me. At a basic level, if you want to grow in knowledge of Christ, you cannot ignore the body of Christ, which is the church. Now, there are some realities that are revealed once you begin to understand this, once you begin to see this, once, once this begins to sink into you in the way that it sank in the Apostle Paul on that road to Damascus. I want to show you one passage that reveals some of these realities. There are others that we could look to, but I want to show you one from Ephesians chapter 3. So if you turn to Ephesians 3 now, we'll look at some of the things that Paul says are revealed in the church as the body of Christ that are significant. In fact, world-changing. Here's what he says as Paul reflects on the reality that the church is the body of Christ. What he writes is this, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. When you read this, Paul says, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
As the Apostle Paul begins to reflect on the nature of the church as the body of Christ, one of the insights that is dominant in his thinking is this, that this great mystery has now been shown to us that both Jew and Gentile are together and they're both partakers of this same body, the body of Christ. The unity that comes in Christ through the gospel, through the work of the Spirit, is something that, that Paul can, can, can barely get his arms around as he writes to the Ephesians. And that reality pervades his whole view of the church because he knows what he's seeing played out in front of him as he looks at the body of Christ is a great mystery and it's a great privilege to be a part of it. And the next question we might ask as we consider the Apostle Paul's view of the body of Christ is this, how then did this reality affect Paul's ministry? And we can see a number of ways in which it affected Paul's ministry. We see it in Ephesians chapter 3. It changed his view of Jew and Gentile. It changed his view of that which was most significant in the world. But we see it played out in other ways as well, in very tangible, concrete, practical ways. One of these ways is revealed to us uh, throughout the book of Acts, actually, but it's very uh, clearly uh, revealed to us in a kind of crystallized form in the book of Titus. Paul, if you remember the context of Titus chapter 1, Paul had done some evangelistic work with Titus on the island of Crete and others as well, but they were a kind of team, evangelistic team on the island of Crete. And Crete was known for all kinds of bad things as well. It wouldn't have appeared to be a very fertile field for the gospel, but nonetheless, Paul went, preached the gospel faithfully with Titus, and lo and behold, the Lord brought about conversions, and there were little pockets of believers scattered throughout the island of Crete, little pockets of those who had heard the gospel, responded in saving faith, and were united to Christ in the way that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And so what Paul does then is Paul himself has to leave Crete after that season, but he leaves Titus there. And what he says to Titus is so vital for our understanding even of our own lives and how we ought to relate to the church. Because what Paul says to Titus is, Titus, the reason that I left you on Crete, this is in Titus 1.5, the reason that I left you uh, in Crete is so that you might put in order what remained and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. You see, for the Apostle Paul, the work wasn't done until not only he saw believers there, but he actually saw functioning, organized, orderly local congregations and a kind of regional church that held them together. That, for Paul, was what he was really after. So you begin to see, for Paul, the centrality of the church. It, it, it changed his understanding of what God was doing in history, it changed his understanding even of his own mission in life. Although Paul was in many respects an evangelist, he, wasn't, he, was, he was more than that. He was a church planter. And, and even when he couldn't stay to do the work of church planting, he left others to do it, to make sure that everything was put in order, that remained, and elders were appointed, that leadership and structure pervaded these little towns with their small bands of fledgling uh, believers. And the reason for this is because not only was Paul's work needing to be centered on the church, but his, his understanding of how spiritual growth took place was centered around the church. If you haven't turned from Ephesians, you're in good shape because I want you to look now at Ephesians 4.1. In Ephesians 4, Paul brings up this idea of walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And indeed, we've been reminded of this text even earlier today. Walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. But I find it striking that when Paul does this, when Paul brings all of this theology to bear on the everyday lives of the Christians to whom he's writing, and he says, here's what it looks like to walk worthy of all of these truths. Look at the 
kinds of things he mentions. He says, walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace because there's one body and one Spirit. Now think about this for a second. Imagine someone came to you and said, I know that you're a Christian and I want to know how to grow as a Christian. I want to know what kinds of attitudes and actions I need to cultivate, what kinds of habits I need to develop. What, what does it mean for me to walk worthy of this high calling to which I have been called? Most of us, I think, would respond to that in a very individualistic way. We would say, well, here's what you need to do. You need to make sure you're involved in personal reading of the Bible, personal prayer. It might be helpful if you kept a record even of your requests to the Lord. And that's where we would start. And then all of that's important. All of that's, in fact, necessary and essential and good for us to cultivate. But you notice that's not where the Apostle Paul goes when he talks about walking worthy of the high calling to which you've been called. Actually, where Paul goes is to this exercise of it within the body of Christ. Paul says, you know what walking worthy looks like? It looks like humility towards others. It looks like bearing with one another in love. It looks like things such as gentleness and patience and eagerness to maintain the unity of the bond of peace because after all, we are at a fundamental level members together of the body of Christ. That's where he begins. And that's such a, an intriguing window into Paul's understanding of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Yes, of course, those individual things are necessary. But actually, spiritual growth takes place in the context of bearing with one another, of being patient with one another, of preserving the unity of the bonds of peace. It's not individually focused. It's actually focused on life within the community of the church. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise to us, because if you look back at the book of Acts and you see that great sermon on the day of Pentecost where Peter reveals and preaches to the people who are gathered there who are asking questions about what's happened and the outpouring of the Spirit. And Peter points them all to Christ and to the fulfillment of prophecy that's taken place in the death and resurrection of Christ. What we find is that 3,000 souls were added to their number that day. And then just after that, we see perhaps an even more remarkable miracle. It's not just that 3,000 Men and women believed on that day, but actually in Acts 2.42, it says they, they began to, to, to gather together and devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to the breaking of bread, and to the fellowship with one another. In other words, they began to do those things which are characteristic of the church. They began to do those things that Paul's reflecting on in Ephesians chapter 4. That, that happened immediately upon their conversion. And so it's no surprise that when Paul thinks of walking worthy of the high calling, he immediately goes to the church, to our life with one another in the church. You can't understand accurately what the Bible says about spiritual growth divorced from being a part of the body of Christ, the church. That, 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 that's, that's fundamental to what it means to walk worthy of this high calling. And there are certain essential elements to our spiritual growth, e essential matters in biblical Christianity that are given in the context of the church. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, lists a number of these things. Paul says, in the context of the local church, should be engaged in public prayer. In the context of the local church, we should be having Scripture read to us, and we ourselves should be hearing Scripture. It should be a, there should be a public reading of Scripture. In the context of the local church, there should be exhortation 
in the context of the local church, we should be sitting under the preaching of the word. In the context of the local church, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, we should be singing. And in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says, in the context of the local church, that's where we have this opportunity to give. All of these things are elements of what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they happen in the church. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer to Hebrews reflects on the great benefits that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, the great blessings that are ours in, in, in the context of Christ's death on our behalf. We have this great high priest. We have this once for all sacrifice. In fact, in Hebrews 10, he says, we have, we have access to the holy places by the blood of Jesus Christ. That would have been mind-blowing for those who knew their Old Testament. Because, you know, in the Old Testament, only one person had access to the holy place and only one time per year, and he had to come with blood. And now the writer to Hebrews says, we have this free access to the holy places because of the blood of Jesus on our behalf. And then he proceeds to give application because of that. Here are the things you're supposed to do in light of this access, this amazing access that you have. And one of the things that he says is this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. For the writer to, uh, to Hebrews, just like the Apostle Paul, when he reflected on the work of Jesus Christ, his mind immediately went to the application, and the application took place, takes place, in the context of the local church. I wonder how central the church is in your own thinking about your spiritual life. I wonder as you think about your next few years, your plans, maybe even further off in the future. How central is the body of Christ in your thinking? You may be sitting here thinking that you're very committed to your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. But the Bible connects that intimately with your working it out in the context of the body of Christ, which is the church. Even in the first century, there were those who neglected the meeting together in the local congregation. The writer to Hebrews talks about that. Uh, but he calls us to something more. He calls us not only to meet together, but to consider before we meet together how we can spur on one another to love and good deeds. It's like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4. Walking worthy involves living with one another and treating one another with love. Now there's another aspect to this as well. And it's something that I mentioned very briefly last night, but we need to dive a little deeper into it this evening. The church, the body of Christ, is also spoken of in Scripture and viewed in Scripture as a covenant community. That's very significant because in the Old Testament, of course, covenants play a massive role in God's relationship with His people and in His revelation of His salvation. And that's not just true in the Old Testament. It's actually true in the New Testament as well. And in order to understand the prominent place of the local church, we have to think about it in, in covenantal terms, because the Bible thinks of it in covenantal terms. Now, now, we're moving here, we're making a transition, because many of the arguments that we've just seen in Scripture have essentially been, uh, what could be viewed as sort of pragmatic arguments. You can't grow unless you're in community. You can't walk worthy unless you're with other people. We need one another to encourage us daily, and we need to be encouraging one another daily. But this, this idea of the church as a covenant community goes a step further. But I think we have to go there because the Bible itself goes there. It's a covenant community 
And it's a covenant community that has been given by the Lord Jesus Christ particular ordinances, uh, particular signs, which are found only there. That is, they're, they're, they're in the context of the local church, and they're meant for our growth. All of these things that I listed earlier, when Paul delineates them in 1 Timothy, public reading of Scripture, preaching, prayer, these are vital to our spiritual development, and they're commanded for the church to practice. But Christ also ordained two sacraments, two signs, two ordinances that are to be practiced in the context of the local church. And, and, and they, in some sense, uh, define what the local church is, what the body of Christ consists of. Now, I want to deal with one of these in brief and then the other at some greater length. The one I want to deal with with a little more brevity because there's, con there's more controversy in this room surrounding it. And I'm not uh, intending to enter into great controversy here, but the one I want to deal with first that is integral to what the church is, is the ordinance or the sacrament of baptism. The Lord Jesus Christ commands us to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That happens in the context of the local church. This isn't something you're, you're going to get and, and be exposed to by simply being off on your own reading your Bible. You may learn a great deal about baptism from that, but, but you, won't, you won't experience it, you won't witness it, because that happens only in the context of the local church. And what does it signify? What does it seal to us? Well, baptism signifies primarily identification with Christ and then the washing that is a part of our, uh, our, our salvation. It's a kind of visible picture of these spiritual realities. And it's called a, a sign and a seal of these things. Again, this is something that we receive and we observe in the context of the body of Christ, and appropriately so. These are things that the Lord Jesus Christ has ordained for us and for the strengthening of our faith. Now, the second ordinance or sacrament that the Lord Jesus Christ has ordained for His church that is to be practiced in and by His church is that of the Lord's Supper or Communion. And I want to spend a little more time on this. Again, this is something that you only get in the context of the body of Christ, the Lord's Supper. Now, when we see the Lord introduce this supper, he introduces it using covenantal language. Jesus says when he first ordains this sacrament for the church, he says, this is the blood of my covenant. And even the Passover meal, even the bread is identified with with this Old Testament covenantal ceremony that takes place in the Scriptures. We see it take place in Exodus 12 with the Passover. We see it with the sacrifices in Leviticus 7. And we see it with covenant ceremonies in Genesis 31. All of that's packed into the meaning of the Lord's Supper as He ordains it and as it's recorded for us in the Gospels. Now, as the rest of the New Testament unfolds the meaning of the Lord's Supper... The, the New Testament uses three primary terms to describe the significance of it. And these might be worth remembering, and you can go back and look at the particular passages in question a little later on. The first, the first aspect of the Lord's Supper that the New Testament deals with at great length is the fact that it is a, it is a memorial, it is a remembrance. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. That's peculiar if you stop to think about it. Oftentimes, if you've had the experience of being with someone when they're nearing death or when they're at a very low point in their health, they might say something like this, don't remember me like this. Don't remember this moment. Remember the good times. Remember the times when I was at my height. But you know, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say that. The Lord says, this 
is a remembrance of my death. This is a remembrance of my broken body and my shed blood. So whenever we participate in the Lord's table, one of the things that's going on there is we're remembering very consciously and corporately remembering the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul makes this very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's one of the things that the Corinthian church actually got wrong about the Lord's Supper. There's a second idea that's wrapped up in this covenant ceremony that takes place within the church, and that's the idea of proclamation. In fact, Paul says, not only do you remember the Lord's death when you're participating in the Lord's Supper, but you're actually proclaiming something. You're stating something. You're, you're shouting something to the world. And what you're proclaiming is the Lord's death until he comes. You are proclaiming in a very public way when you participate in the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming the significance of Christ's death for you, and you're also proclaiming your confidence in his return one day. That is no small thing. There are people, Christians, in many parts of the world today who know that every time they participate in the Lord's Supper, they are committing a political, public act that will be viewed as treasonous by the governing authorities. And in a sense, that's in line with what we read in the New Testament, because it isn't just a memorial, it's a proclamation, the Bible tells us. The Bible also tells us this, that when we come to the Lord's table as the body of Christ, we enjoy fellowship with one another on a horizontal level and by the Holy Spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, this is one of the arguments that Paul uses against some of these Corinthians who thought that they could go to the house of idols and participate in those meals and also come and participate in the Lord's Supper. He said, no, don't you understand? The, 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 the bread that we break is a sharing with the Lord himself, a fellowship with the Lord himself. And the cup that we drink is a sharing, a fellowship in the blood of Christ. And so it is today. And we may, you may, view all of that as very insignificant, perhaps even perfunctory in your lives. But the reality is the Bible does not view it that way. The Bible views, uh, views it as one of the ways in which the Lord Jesus Christ graciously strengthens us and causes us to grow in our knowledge of him and in our witness for him. And there's only one place where that happens. It's in the context of the church as ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to grow in the knowledge of Christ, well, certainly you have to grow in your understanding of the body of Christ because it reveals the mysteries of Christ. If you want to grow in your knowledge of Christ, you have to grow in your commitment to the body of Christ because it's in the context of that commitment that we're sharpening one another, we're learning from one another, we're growing in humility and in patience, and, and we're, be, we're having receiving exhortation and sitting under preaching and praying with each other and encouraging each other and having opportunities to give and to sing together and all of these things that entail the church. If you want to grow in your knowledge of Christ, you need to utilize the means that Christ himself has provided. These signs and seals of these amazing, remarkable gospel truths intended to fortify us and strengthen our faith. This is what the Bible teaches about the church. What would it show if we spurned these things? What would it show about us? What would it say about us if we said, I like the idea of following Jesus, 
but I want to forget the church. Well, what it would certainly show is that we weren't thinking biblically about growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've mentioned 1 Timothy several times because Paul wrote that letter to Timothy to instruct him about how the church was to operate. And he says as much in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But I want to read the words that Paul uses just so you see how central this is in your Christian life. Paul writes this to Timothy. I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And then he says this, flowing right from those words. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. See what's going on under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the mind of the Apostle Paul. I'm so concerned that you know how you ought to behave in the church and how the church ought to operate and function. Because, because woven into the fabric of what the church is and what the church does is the mystery of godliness in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ from beginning to end. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and do so by participating in the body of Christ and receiving from Christ in his body those means of grace which he so graciously bestows on the church. Let's pray together. Oh, our God, we thank you for the mysteries revealed to us in the church. We thank you for the clear instruction we receive about how your church is to function. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would love the church, that we would give thanks for the church, that we would be engaged with the church. We pray that in so doing, you would cause us to grow in our understanding of these wonderful truths about Christ and his work. We ask all of this in Christ's name.